Welcome everyone. It's nice to see some very familiar faces and it's very nice to see some new faces. Thank you all. Rabbi David Lazar, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing you in person. I know we've talked several times. Suzanne, it's so nice to see you. It's nice really nice. You. Socorro, thank you all so Hi, much. Hello. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. Um, I've been I've been very conflicted with everything. For those of you that know me, I'm a mother and I'm an immigrant. I was I came here, I was brought here on a um, without the legal papers. So I know what it is to live in fear. And that's one of the reasons that I am so passionate about my work. And I am totally upset about what I see happening. And um, and we'll share more with you on that. And also because within my work with the diet, previous work with the diocese and being an advocate for the last 20 some years for immigrants, we should be doing a lot better by now. My God, we should have a better system in place. And so I don't see that happening at all, which is really upsetting. But anyhow, this isn't about me. I just wanted to share a little bit with you about why for me it's really important to have this conversation with you all. And um, most importantly for us as people of faith to begin having a dialogue a dialogue to truly do justice. Um, earlier today, I was um, praying about, you know, just in my prayer, and I remember this quote, let justice roll down like water. But justice is not being done for these children and the immigrants in our country. They are being used as pawns for political gain and again for profit. And that has me completely upset. So anyhow, um, for those that do not know me, I am Hilda Cruz. I am a faith organizer with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, an organization that has been dedicated into exposing the root causes of mass incarceration, um, the detention of immigrants, the criminalization of, um, color, of people of color. We believe that every person is sacred across bars and borders, and that's the reason why I do what I do with this amazing organization, because I feel that I am allowed to walk the talk. And so this is extremely important for me. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead. Um, just wanted to also share with you that we are recording this, um, this dialogue, dialogue among us, just so that we can revisit um, some of the things that might be said and also so that we can um just capture everybody's thoughts better and share with those that couldn't be join us today so i'm gonna go ahead and also share our um agenda you're gonna get to see my screen oh my goodness I, maybe just, I, should... I just put it in the chat too oh you put it in the chat okay so maybe you guys can open that if you are, are able to and I cannot minimize because I am recording. So maybe we should open it up in the chat. And so with that said, um, let me see how many of us are we? There's only 22. How about we introduce ourselves? We just say our name and then um, who you're with. But I also, we have one little, um, like what brought you to this meeting? What concern, care or concern you have about what you're hearing about what's happening in the Pomona Fairplex? And um, what would you like to share with us today? So let's begin with that. And then um, I- In 30 seconds, in 30 seconds. Within 30 seconds. And then just say, invite somebody you see on the screen. For example, I already, I already introduced myself I'm going to ask Deborah to do the same, and then she popcorns it to somebody else. How's that? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, great. Thank you all for being here with us. Um, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you. Um, I'm the director of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity based in, uh, based in the Oakland office. And um, what concerns me is 
the the lack of ability for people to see some other alternatives to the current situation. And I will invite uh, Reverend Victoria. Good morning. Uh, still morning, no, it's afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Reverend Victoria Bomberry, and I'm with the Riverside Center for Spiritual Living in Riverside, California. And I've been concerned about uh, the proliferation of uh, these places for uh, holding children and the conditions that might be there. And uh, I've been concerned about this issue for, for several years, and uh, I know that uh, uh, we have to make more headway than we're making right now. And I'm concerned about that. And let me see. Uh, Denise Spooner. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Denise Spooner, and I'm a member of the Claremont United Church of Christ. Um, I came to the issue of um, the concern about the children anyway, through my work with asylum seekers. Um, and I was introduced by Hilda to that work. Um, I've always, I've had uh, all my life, I've had a concern for justice. I'm the middle child. And of course, the middle children always think that life is unjust for them within the family. But um, now under these circumstances, I mean, it truly is so much injustice that has been going on. And I've been very concerned that the children are becoming our victims of the kind of injustice that has always been part of this immigration system. The idea, I'm a historian by training, by profession, and the idea that, um, that this has been a country of immigrants and the happy story about how we've been welcoming to all immigrants has never really been the truth. And um, it would be nice if we could change that. So that's, uh, so that's me. And I'm going to pass it to Rabbi David Lazar. Hello. On this particular day, my mind is not only on children uh, in our area in Southern California, but uh, in Palestine and Israel. I um, have a great concern not only for children, in particular children, who certainly are in no way responsible for the situation they've been put in. Um, our Congregation in Palm Springs is a little bit limited because we function more in the other side of Riverside County. But I think we need to know about what's going on and make sure that we can do everything we can possibly do on this side of it as well. I'd like to hand the microphone over to my, my teacher, uh, Rabbi Hillel. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Hillel Cohn, Rabbi Emeritus of Congregation Emmanuel of Redlands, formerly of San Bernardino. Uh, I, my interest uh, springs primarily because I am an immigrant. I came here as a refugee from Nazi Germany. But the, my concern is that we not treat children or adults by warehousing them. And I think that's one of the things that we're facing. It's one thing uh, to house them, but it's another to simply deprive them of human dignity. And I'm so grateful to Hilda for uh, alerting us to all these things that take place. And with that, I'll pass this on to uh, Joy Rockwood. We're very concerned. I'm from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we are very concerned about the things that are happening. Um, I, I, I'm amazed at this. I'm, start, I'm glad that we've got this um, group together, and I hope we get something worked out because of it. And I will pass this on to Karen Sapio. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Sapio, pastor at Claremont Presbyterian Church. And coming to this through our, our refugee concerns team, which has been, was, was formed about five years ago when uh, the concern was primarily Syrian and other um, refugees from that area coming into our area and since expanded to work with uh, asylum seekers. And so uh, this seems just to be the, the logical next step in uh, trying to work uh, with organizations that are trying to mitigate the impact of that on the people involved, those who are suffering. So I will call on uh, 
Jesse Smith. Hi, I'm Jesse Smith. I'm the rector at St. Ambrose Episcopal Church in Claremont and uh, very grateful for this meeting to be here today. I'm most interested in, in hearing about what um, forms of oversight are in place at this time um, and what local congregations can do um, to support. So thank you and I will pass to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut, you, cut you just a little bit only because um, we have a special guest that we need to hear from him, but because he has an appointment with his eyes checking at two thirty, we really need to hear him. So I'm gonna just shift a little bit. Um, his name is Misael. Misael, te voy a invitar a que te pongas en cámara. I met Misael in 2019. Um, he is an unaccompanied minor. It took him a couple of years to get to our border from Honduras. And when he presented himself asking for asylum, he was placed in detention. So I'm going to invite him to share it in, in Spanish and please bear with us. Then I'll come in and I'll um, let you know what he said in English and we'll have this conversation. But I, I think his, his story must be shared, not only here, but everywhere, because this is what we're setting up these children for in the future. So Misael. Um, I met him, I, I met him with a group from Claremont who was visiting people in detention. And this is where we met Misael. Misael, introducete, por favor. Uh, hola, como están? Este, mi nombre es Misael Reyes y soy de Honduras. Cuéntanos. Cuéntanos qué pasó. He says, hi, his name is Misael. He's from Honduras. ¿Qué pasó cuando te entregaste? Llegaste a la frontera de 17 años. Uh -huh. ¿Y qué pasó? Pues sí, me entregué a la frontera y pues de ahí este, me llevaron este, dos por tres días a la hielera. He says he came to ICE, he presented himself, and he was held in what it's called the ICE box. Y um, luego de ahí, este, me sacaron y me llevaron a un edificio en San Diego por una, una noche. He then was transferred into this um, building in San Diego for a night. Y después y de ahí? Luego de ahí, al siguiente día por la... La mañana me trasladaron a, al albergue de menores que está ubicado en Fullerton. From there, he was taken to the shelter in the city of Fullerton. This is a shelter for minors. ¿Y, y cómo fue tu tiempo en ese albergue? I'm asking him, how was his time in that um, shelter in Fullerton? Este, bueno, básicamente... Um, Ya me sentí un poco más mejor porque estaba más seguro, me sentía en este país, pero a la vez estaba uh, uh, como puedo decir uh, tenso y preocupado por la situación, no sabía si me quedaría o me regresaría en mi país. He says, well, he felt relief from being at the shelter because it was very different, right, than what he was used to. He also felt very preoccupied about his status. He didn't know um, really what was what was happening. Tenías tus parientes, cuéntanos de tus parientes. Sí, tenía mi familia este, en diferentes estados de acá de, bueno, de este país, pero se les hizo un poco difícil este, ayudarme a salir de ahí porque básicamente uh, ellos son la mayoría indocumentados. Okay. So he had extended family in different states in the country, but it was very complicated for them to help them because they were undocumented themselves. ¿Y so cuánto tiempo duraste en el albergue? Estuve en el albergue um, 
tres meses. ¿Y cómo fue tu tiempo esos tres meses? He was in the shelter for three months. Este, básicamente, bueno, este, fue igual difícil porque uno no está seguro si tiene lo necesario, este, lo llevan a la escuela, tiene comida, agua, ropa, pero, o sea, no, no es nada como que uno se siente feliz porque a veces uno necesita el calor de, de un familiar que lo esté apoyando y diciendo que todo va a estar bien. So he says that while he had a roof over his head, food on the table and water, and he was being taken to school um, to learn, there was this human need of being in proximity with a family that um, he was hurting for. ¿Y qué pasó cuando, cuando cumples tus 18 años? Y pues, bueno, como mi familia no me pudo ayudar a salir de ahí, se llegó la fecha de mi cumpleaños, entonces me celebraron los 18 años y ese mismo día, en la escuela me celebraron los 18 años y ese mismo día por la tarde me hablaron en la escuela. So he says that on, on his 18th birthday he went to school and they celebrated his birthday. Everything was very happy. But then he was told at the school that he needed to return to the shelter early. ¿Y qué pasó cuando llegas al, al albergue? Pues este, solo me dijeron que arreglara la, la, la maleta con mi ropa, zapatos, cuadernos, todo lo que tenía de ahí. Y me estaba esperando dos oficiales de inmigración y me esposaron las manos y me pusieron este, los pies con cadenas. So he says he um, arrived at the shelter. He was asked to go and remove, pack all his things, um, all his clothes, his belongings. And um, because there were two ICE officers who were waiting for him there. And as soon as he was done packing, they handcuffed him and they tied his feet with shackles and they removed him from the shelter. ¿A dónde te llevaron, Misael? Uh, me llevaron a Santa Ana a una detención federal que se llama Pure Lazy. So he was taken to the jail in Santa Ana that had a contract with ICE called Theo Lacey. ¿Cuánto tiempo estuviste ahí? Ahí estuve uh, tres meses también. So he was there for three months. ¿Y qué pasaba? ¿Qué sentías? ¿Qué era lo que? ¿Cuál fue tu reacción? I'm asking him what was his reaction when he found out he was in a jail. Pues fue difícil, pues, este, a pasar de un lugar donde estaba más o menos cómodo, este, pasar a una detención de mayores, un trato súper diferente, y pues donde también estaba más que inseguro de lo que pasaría conmigo, porque es un proceso más complicado. So he says it was very different and difficult from going from a place where he is seen as a child and cared for to going to an adult jail with other adults and just feeling so much uncertainty. ¿Cómo fue que saliste de, la, de, de ahí? Pues llegando ahí como a los dos días, este, uh, llegó una abogada de una organización que creo que se llama Defendiendo Migrantes, la cual me pidió permiso a ver si ella podía ayudarme um, y tomar mi caso para ver si el juez podía aprobar una fianza. So he says he was visited by a lawyer who was from a, an organization that was helping immigrants. And she asked if she could represent him. And he agreed and he represented him in his um, court trial. Cuéntanos un poco de ese proceso de la corte. Pues bueno, para que ella la, la dejaran tomar mi caso tardó aproximadamente un mes. En ese mes, este, yo, te, yo ya había tenido dos cortes que me representé solo y fue muy difícil porque no tenía nadie, no sabía qué decir, uh, nunca he tenido una experiencia de de ir a una corte era mi primera vez. 
So he, he had to represent himself twice before in court without knowing how to or what was happening or knowing the language. And so he agreed to have this representation from a lawyer, right? Somebody in the chat is asking how old he was when he left. ¿Cuántos años tenías cuando tú saliste de Honduras? Tenía 14 años. He was 14 when he left his hometown, but he was 17 when he finally made it to the border. So that's a whole other different story, right? Um, this is otra that, that we can share later on. Um, he left. Quieren saber por qué te fuiste de Honduras? Por qué saliste de Honduras? Y está bien decir eso. Sí. Pues, básicamente, este, ya este, mi familia tomó la decisión, bueno, de sacarlos del país debido a que, bueno, ellos trabajan en la Iglesia Católica y, pues, um, cuando las Los niños este, cumplen por lo menos 15 años, este, están siendo obligados a entrar a la, a la, a los grupos, este, um, criminales más conocidos como maras, pandillas. So he, he was, he left because his dad pretty much felt that was the safest thing for him to do because most young men were being forced into joining one of the gangs. Um, and you end up being killed either way. So that's why he left. Um, ¿cuál, es tu, ¿Cuál es tu status ahora? Pues, ¿Cuál es tu status migratorio? Estoy en proceso de, de, de asilo. ¿Y cuál es ese proceso? ¿Ya te lo dieron? No, todavía estoy. Okay. So I asked him what is his um, legal status, which I know. Um, He's still seeking asylum. Paperwork was turned in a couple of years ago. He does not have a work permit. He is still seen as why the reason why he's going to have to leave soon is because he needs to check in with his ICE officer. And they do this because they don't want him working. They want to make sure that they don't work until they go through the process, which is long. It is tedious. It is expensive and very unfair. Gracias, Misael, por tener la valentía de, de estar con nosotros, de contarnos tu historia. ¿Cómo te sientes tú con todo esto de los niños? Quiero nada más para ya terminar y dejarte. Cuando tú oyes acerca de los niños, I'm asking him about the children. How does he feel? ¿Cómo te sientes? Pues, la verdad, este, uh, como le digo, eso, um, Esos este, albergues para menores sí tienen lo necesario, pero no es nada, este, um, bueno, no está bien para mí que los estén dejando tanto tiempo ahí porque, o sea, bueno, como le digo, necesita básicamente estar con la familia, que lo apoyen y pues básicamente ahí pues uno no sabe el, uh, qué, qué será de uno en, el, en lo estando en esto en ese albergue porque básicamente uno no se puede comunicar tanto tiempo con la familia gracias y voy a dejar ahorita les traduzco pero te voy a dejar que te que te vayas muchísimas gracias eh? este misael he says he um well he feels that it's um he has mixed feelings about the shelter the shelter both because he knows that the children have a roof over their head and the necessities, but yet he feels that longing and that hurt for the extent to be with the family members and they can't. And also because he knows that the time to really talk with your family members is very, very limited while you're in there. So, gracias, Misael. Varias personas me están diciendo, te agradecen mucho el que tú puedas este, compartir con nosotros. Eh? Muchísimas gracias, okay. Misael. Y hasta yes. luego. Bye, everyone. Vaya suerte. Gracias. And so this is this is the story, and this is part for those of us that have been accompanying asylum seekers. 
we know that the system, the immigration system that we have had for decades is meant to leave out people, to not legalize the status, and also to, um, to uh, discriminate, profit from, and it's a very racist system, if I may say so. So with that said, um, I know I'm all lost. Let me look at the agenda again, but I know. Um, we, could, we could continue with the um, introductions, but maybe just ask people to be a tiny bit briefer in the okay. interest of time. But it, I think it's helpful that this first meeting that we hear from everybody and know who's here. So maybe we could go to um, Lara, Lara Martin. I'm Laura Martin. I'm pastor here at Good Shepherd Lutheran in Claremont and just one interested in, in knowing what is going on, uh, particularly with the um, at the Fairplex um, and and how faith communities can be of support um, in this time. So inter interested in connecting. Uh, Thank you. You want to choose somebody else to go next? Uh, uh, Tom Johnson, I see you on here. You're muted, Tom. Always has to be remember to be on mute. <laughs> I'm Tom Johnson. I'm a retired uh, Lutheran clergy, also a professor at Claremont School of Theology. I served there for 23 years. Um, I'm also the current president of the Claremont Interfaith Council which I'm very glad to see so many of my colleagues on this call as well. And we're just even together as a as a council want to be able to see what we can do and how we can work together to provide assistance and and motivate people to get involved. So thank you. Do you want to choose uh, somebody to go next? Oh, who hasn't gone? I came in a little late. <laughs> so raise your hand if you haven't gone yet. <laughs> All right. Is that uh, Sharla? Hang on. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes, Sharla. I'm Sharla Spence. I'm from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I am, um, I, everything that has been addressed already, I don't want to take time to go say it again. But all of those topics are very interesting to me. But particularly, I'm concerned about the care while they are in whatever situation they are placed in, that they're getting what they need uh, as far as care. And let's see who, uh, Dave Andrews. Hi, I'm Dave Andrews. I'm also with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I also work with uh, Tom and Karen and Lara on the Claremont Interfaith Council. And I'm a faculty member at the Claremont Colleges where I'm the chair of the Committee on Religious Affairs. And I share the concerns that have been raised and, and, and uh, join Tom and uh, his desire to find ways that we can work together as a community to make things better. And I'll call upon uh, Socorro, Socorro Baron. Good afternoon. I'm Socorro Barron, and I'm in Orange County. Uh, we've started it last year. We started the Orange County Madrinas, which um, we're trying to get involved and, and see what where we can help or what we can do. My biggest concern this uh, this afternoon is what's going to happen to our children when they turn 18 is ice going to be called on them and i will pick uh, uh maria elena perales thank you hi my name is maria elena perales and i direct the saint joseph justice center for the sisters of saint joseph of orange and of course, we're very concerned about the well being of all these children being put in detention centers. Maria Elena, you want to choose somebody else? Sorry, I forget. Oh, I choose John Skrodinski. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Brother John Skrudinski. Um, I'm a Catholic missionary brother, and I live in Riverside, California. Um, my connection mostly is through ILDA here and, and trying to be as supportive as I can. Yeah, I'm definitely interested in continuing to find out what the status now is. Um, I helped two young boys when I was in New Jersey some years ago, and I know they went through some programs like the Southwest Key programs and places like that where they got education and stuff as well. But I wanted to see how things have been, uh, how things are going now. And I, and I certainly want to know how to stay involved and help in any way. So I'll pick somebody else, if whoever has their hand up. Um, Suzanne, please. Uh, Suzanne Singer. I am Suzanne Singer. I'm the rabbi of Temple Bethel in Riverside. And I'm concerned about the trauma that the children are um, experiencing and that are that is long term. Um, and I'm also curious about something because I saw a headline saying that I think it was Mark Takano and Raul Ruiz and a bunch of other uh, legislators went to visit the uh, Pomona shelter and found that it was fine. So I, I'm curious to know what people think if that's true. Thank you. Um, let's see. How about Gabriella? <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriela Fernandez. I'm an intern with um, Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Um, I'm concerned about a lot of things, but more specifically on the information that's being um, like spread to the public because I didn't hear about this Fairplex, Fairplex um, shelter until it was brought to my attention. And so considering the fact that I didn't know, and I'm on social media a lot, means there's a heat, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and I pick Maria Ortiz, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, I am Maria Lupita Ortiz. I'm a Freedom Camping Coordinator with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And I am here because I'm concerned. Uh, as Hilda said, I'm an advocate as she has been for years on immigration issues and for fair laws and on immigration. But I'm also a, a Latin American studies minor and it worries me to see history repeating so much. The fact that these children are being placed in Japanese camps from former history worries me. The fact that this is looking a lot like the Holocaust and a lot of other things worry me. I wanna know that. We're not being lied in. And as Socorro said, what are these kids, where are these kids heading after? Sorry, so I think Carlos hasn't gone. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carlos Carrillo. I'm uh, representing Uncommon Good here in Claremont and also uh, All Saints Church in Pasadena. And I share all your concerns, all your topics. Here on Uncoming Good, we work with AB 540 students, and we're also concerned about what's going to happen to, this, to the kids in these uh, so-called shelters after they leave, especially with their education. Thank you, Carlos. Phil, my friend Phil, hasn't. Hi. Hello. I'm Philip Hofer. Uh, I represent, I'm part of a Peace and Justice Commission at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. I also work with GISA, a local Claremont effort to um, accompany um, asylum seekers. Um, and I'm part of a, a community, a senior community, Pilgrim Place in Claremont, in which there's significant interest by a group of folks here. Uh, I want to know what the balance is between my, my involvement, our involvement, in supporting uh, efforts and protesting them or being active against them. To me, the question is, what is the balance? And then I'll conclude by apologizing that in less than 10 minutes, I have to excuse myself from the meeting. But it's good to be here and meet you all. Thank you, Phil. Is there somebody else? I see Lu uh, Lucy Dominguez from the Diaconate Office in Orange County. I'm um, introducing herself on the chat. I'm not sure if somebody else. Margo. Margo. Yes, hi, I'm Margo. Uh, I'm also a resident at Pilgrim Place. And 
Um, I'm just here as a concerned person, and I'm also like uh, Rabbi Lazar, thinking about what's happening to uh, the children uh, in Palestine and Israel. Thank you, Marva. Kathy? Hi, good afternoon. I apologize, I came in late, I had another meeting. Um, I'm so grateful to see all of you here. I am fourth generation Chinese, granddaughter of Franchi Yep, and I'm a professor of Asian American Studies at Pitzer College of the Claremont Colleges, and been in a multi-year partnership with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity in a variety of ways. And um, my concerns, I'm concerned that this will be normalized, that we'll just be, have it hidden in plain sight. And I'm concerned about the charity frameworks and I'm concerned about sexual abuse um, of the children. And I am excited to create radical change and get at the root causes and dismantle Title 42. Thank you. And Dave, did you go Dave? I'm, I'm Dave Herrig from uh, Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Claremont. Uh, living only uh, maybe a couple miles south of the Fairplex, um, curious and interested to know what's happening to the kids there, how they're getting uh, reorganized and reconnected with family and so on. Thank, Thank you. you Dave. Thank you. And we have Teresa. I think Teresa, I've seen her. She might have had her vaccine. But um, if there's somebody else that we missed, please let us know in the chat. And as you can see, there's a lot of concerns, right? I think we already created a lot of the questions that we have as a group. And so um, let me share a little bit of context, right? This is not the first time that we have seen this happen. We saw it, I saw it, and I was involved with unaccompanied minors back in 2014 where we responded to some of them. We saw it happening again in 2018, 2019. That's how I met Misael and met others. Um, I've, I've had the honor of accompanying several families who are now part of the 11 million people in shadow right now. And so I wanna just, I am most grateful that you're here today, that you are share my concerns and my interest in wanting to do that radical transformation that is needed, that we are capable of, and that we must demand. So thank you so much. I hope that by the end, we'll have a clear strategy among us of what does that, what does that look like as people of faith? I was supposed to have an, uh, invited a um, case worker. I don't know if, if he's here, um, I've been checking. I've been checking. I don't see him. Maybe he'll join us later. He's a caseworker inside the Pomona Fairplex, and I really wanted for him to share his concerns with all of you because he has a lot of concerns of what he's seen. But I am not going to speak to that. So instead, let me move on, and hopefully we can hear um, from my other friend who's been part of the meetings um, that has been taken, have been taken place weekly, and this is Denise. So, Denise, I invite you to come and share what you've been told. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Yes, I've been going uh, every Friday at five o'clock. There has been a meeting. I've been going for about a month now, um, and this meeting um, uh, is uh, run by the uh, Inland Empire Coalition for Immigrant Justice, but it involves um, people at every level of, of the effort at Fairplex. Um, the way in which that effort is organized, as some of you already know, is that there is a department within the, or a, um, uh, an office within the Department of Homeland Security called the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And they're the ones that have been organizing uh, both physically as well as management wise of the children and the effort at Fairplex. They contract out work to another organization called Cherokee Federal. Cherokee Federal is a for-profit corporation that is um, part of the Cherokee Nation. They have some experience with 
um, child trafficking with, um, I guess, hunting down and uh, investigating child trafficking. And that's part of the reason that they were chosen, I believe, for this effort, because they do have experience with children that the other primary government contractors, the Geo Corporation, which runs Adelanto, and Core Civic, the other large private prison corporation um, that's a contractor of the federal government, that they do not have. Um, this meeting has, um, has revealed the extent to which the government was not prepared for bringing in all of these children because it seems like everyone pretty much was thrown into a pool, um, as Hilda put it one time, that they, they were people who didn't know how to swim and they had to learn how on the fly. Um, and the Cherokee Federal then has been contracting some of their work at finding caseworkers as well as, as, well as what they call youth counselors um, for the children out to another organization. And I'm sorry, I forgot the name of that group, but they're trying to hire 800 people who would come in and basically um, not as caseworkers, but as people who would um, oversee the children's activities. In addition to these organizations, the County of Los Angeles and um, uh, has been deeply involved in this effort, um, of course, because they had to contract, they had to sign a contract with the county for, you, for the use of Fairplex. And so working with the county, they were in charge, the people at Fairplex were in charge of the actual physical arrangement of the space. Um, then um, they are, I think probably their, their involvement is probably lessening somewhat because uh, most everything is set up um, already. I mean, in terms of the physical facility for the children, there are 50 acres um, for the children or that have been set aside for, for this effort. Um, there's several layers of security, and this is the usual security organization that exists at Fairplex. So there's people who, um, who patrol the perimeter, um, but then there's also security inside. And the people who are the security inside are not wearing uniforms. That was one of the concerns that people on the call had, that the children not be afraid that these are you know, la migra, and that they're going to be uh, taken and put into prison in some way. Now, this is what they're telling us. And I know that some people have had experience already. And so, you know, there may be another reason why the people are not dressed like that. But um, because I'm not on the inside, and I don't speak Spanish, um, all I can do is tell you what it is that they're telling us. So there are the la these layers of security. Um, they said that the children uh, are going to be um, within the contract that was signed with Cherokee Federal, that the children will be getting about three hours of education every day. And they're already using some of the facilities for play that have been set up, um, like using a soccer field and, and so forth. Um, la as of last Friday, there were 225 children at the facility um, two of the children that had been brought in last week were already reunited with, with family members. Whoops, there went my light. Um, sorry about that. Um, they've already been reunited with family members. The goal is that no child stays at that facility for more than 72 hours. Um, now the maximum capacity that facility will hold is 2,500 children. And in the experience of the, of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, they said that about 20% of the children do not have family members or caregivers or target um, friends in the United States. And so that 20% of all the children will need foster families or foster situations um, as soon as possible. The way in which it was first described to us that the um, Cherokee Federal matches the children with their parents was through cheek swabs um, so that they look for a family relationship through DNA testing. So they swab the kids and they swab whomever it is as their target. That's part of the reason why they said that it takes a while. But last on last week's call, it sounded like 
some of the people are like, they're not always following that procedure that if the children have documentation or the parents have documentation that they don't have to go through a big investigation to find out whether or not um, the people, the children come with their contact information for um, that they're that they are reunited with them after a more cursory investigation. Um, let's see what else can I tell you quickly about it. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit? Because um, at first I heard they were not going to be asking for donations at all, and all of a sudden I see a lot of people asking for donations. Yes, they said so. One of one of the things because of my interest in the immigration and justice for asylum seekers, especially, especially given the history, this country's history in um, in places like Honduras and Guatemala and so forth, that um, that I I asked two questions that have come up in some of your comments. One I asked about the vol about volunteers that a lot of people from the faith communities in the area are asking about how they might volunteer. And so one of the ways in which they said that people could volunteer is by making a donation. And that is being, those donations are being taken by the Pomona Community Foundation. Um, I don't know what use those donations are being put to. The one kind of donations they said they absolutely do not need are the usual things that people give, like clothing, blankets, um, toys, things like that. Um, the other, so that's one way of volunteering. But I said, well, you know, that there are a lot of other people that are saying, you know, can we pack, um, you know, activity bags or can we come in and play with the children in order to, you know, help them feel more welcome or whatever. And um, they said at this point in time, they did not have a contract with anyone, although they were working on it because they, because so many people want to volunteer, it needs to be organized. And so what they've done is I believe by this, I know at this point in time, they've signed a contract. Cherokee Federal has signed a contract with the Pomona Economic Opportunity Center. They also run the day laborers program in Pomona. And those people are going to be organizing the volunteers, but they don't, I was just in touch with, um, with the woman there, Claudia, and she said they don't know what that looks like right now because they need to hire a volunteer coordinator. And so because they just signed the contract, they don't yet have the money to pay somebody to be a volunteer coordinator to um, manage all the people who want to come in and do something, whether it's activity bags or, you know, play soccer with the kids or whatever. I think we have to also keep in mind though that they say that the majority of the children, they want them out and with their families as quickly as possible. That's what they say. Um, I did also ask the question of if, if a child is like a 17 year old, when they turn 18, are they going to be turned over to ICE exactly like what happened with Misael? and has happened to other people. And there was never a clear answer on that. One of the groups that is involved um, with this effort is Immigrant Defenders. And they also expressed the same concern that they did not want these children being turned over to ICE just because they turned 18. Um, so those that so the volunteering that may be coming together as soon as um, they, as soon as the Pomona Economic Opportunity Center can hire a volunteer coordinator. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for that. So it's, um, things are, like I said, it's just like people were thrown into a pool and they didn't know how to swim and they're just learning now. Um, However, I, I have to tell you, it's been done before. We should have all known how this we was going to be. known, work. exactly. The one thing I do want to say, though, is that I mentioned that figure that there's a capacity of 2,500 children, and they expect that this is going to go on for probably about 18 months. I believe that's how long the contract is. The government has wow. signed with Cherokee Federal and with Pomona, with the county. Um, and of that, 20% won't have family members to go to or friends or anybody. 
from Pomona alone, that means 500 children. And we know that there are these centers also in Long Beach and San Diego, and I believe they're setting up another one in Monterey, in Monterey. Yeah. Um, there are centers like this all over the country. And yeah. so that's a whole lot of kids mm -hmm. who will be placed and maybe foster care is better. We know the foster care system, at least in Los Angeles County, leaves a lot to be desired. And yep. so, you know, this is not a, even putting them in foster care is not a good situation in the end. It may be better than a mass detention center, but it's no good answer, not for mm. children. It's very traumatizing. Um, there has been uh, one of the requirements for people to come and volunteer that they've talked about is people who are experienced in uh, trauma care. Yeah. Recognizing that a lot of the kids have been through a lot. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to put my phone number in the chat. If anybody wants to be in touch with me, I'll put my email in there as well. I'm going to continue to attend these meetings on Friday um, as long as they go on. So thank you. Thank you, Denise, for that. And, and with that said, I know that a lot, probably a lot of questions have come up. But before we go into that section portion, I want to invite Deb to also give us some of the feedback. Uh, Reverend Deborah Lee, who's been um, also attending other meetings where we hear what's happening at the state and national level. So, Deb. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Denise. I appreciate you getting that information by going to those other meetings. I want to just say, you know, the purpose of this meeting was really to come together, you know, not with the primary stakeholders, but really as a community, communities of interest and accountability. Um, and also, you know, people both with coming from faith, a faith perspective, the faith community, as well as our allies who are also coming from this very similar moral and values perspective. Uh, our organization, as Hilda mentioned, has been part of efforts to end immigration detention completely in the state of California. Um, been involved with laws, um, you know, to phase out the private, um, the use of for-profit detention. Been involved with efforts to close in lo county local uh, contracts with ICE as well. So we've been pushing for um, an argument that detention is not, it does not even, should not even be part of the whole immigration process. It's unnecessary and does not to be, need to be part of that and not humane. So this is the perspective that we're coming from. And especially as the, the faith community kind of looking that, I wanted to share with you, we are in dialogue with other organizations across the state who are organizing around these other localities where there are these child detention facilities, San Diego, Long Beach, Pomona. Um, there's talk about Fresno mentioned that to Gabriela and uh, in Monterey County at Camp Roberts, but there are others, many others in Texas. So we're trying, people are trying to piece together nationally in the state. Um, what is, what is a, what is an appropriate response for this? So I wanted to just mention a couple of things just to, as a way for us to think about and frame our approach to this issue, especially from a justice perspective. I think we can ask the question about what is charity and compassion and there are going to be ways to answer that question, but I think front and center, we have to kind of ask the justice question. And the first strategy is here in the notes, current responses and strategies across the state is to push for and advocate for prevention of the separation of children from their families to begin with. Prevention of unaccompanied children. Many unaccompanied children, what the government calls unaccompanied children, like let's remember that's a government term, um, we're not unaccompanied, uh, you know, like that term, we have to really interrogate that term. And so we want to push for strategies that are preventing families from getting separated and coming across. For example, we have a family, a mother here, she and her um, uh, daughter were asked for asylum three times and were denied at the border. And she finally said, I'm going to let my daughter go ahead of me on her own to join her family member here because unaccompanied children are not being rejected, but families are and parents are and, and single adults are. So prevention of the separation, many of those unaccompanied children, they have left their parents because they were being denied at the border. 
So that's the um, end of Title 42, which Kathy yet mentioned, which is basically a Trump era policy that the Biden administration is continuing to uphold, which is basically to shut out asylum seekers. Um, so that's the one thing. The other thing is prevention of separation through changing the practices of border patrol policy, which create separation because they don't they call you unaccompanied if you're coming with an older brother, if you're coming with a grandmother, if you're coming with an aunt or uncle, they will separate you from that family member and classify you as unaccompanied, put you in a shelter and put grandma in another facility, a detention facility, creating this whole, you know, that whole web mess of bureaucracy that human beings are getting lost into. So I think the first thing is as a faith community prevention of harm prevent the separation at all. If they were being allowed as family units to come in, they would still be together. Miss Ayel would still be together. Um, so um, I want to mention something about that 72 hour uh, mark is that the 72 hour mark is part of the Flores legal settlement. Legally, they're only supposed to keep children 72 hours. That has, not, that has never been true. They, they break that all the time. I think that the Guardian article I read yesterday said, well, it's a little better than under Trump, but it's like the average is one month instead of four months of stay. But a lot of kids are there for over, over a year, well over a year under, under the Trump administration. So the prevention of separation is one of the advocacy points that has not been raised. And um, our officials that have said, okay, we're gonna work with DHS and Becerra to set up these facilities are not in turn asking for a change in our, our border policy, which would prevent separation. The second thing is small facilities infrastructure. ORR has small facilities, uh, they need more of them. I mean, we all know that mass anything usually does not amount to a lot of good care in any, you know, in any, in any situation. So small facilities is what if it has, if they have to be sheltered uh, or they don't have family members or something like that, it should be small, not large. Um, and then expediting reunification. We wanna advocate where are the resources going towards um, having a vetting sponsorship, vetting a family and sponsorship process that works. You know, like Ms. Ayel said, he had family in multiple states. None of them could get to him and claim him and get him out of there. So we need a vetting and sponsorship process that works and we need to put resources into that for more expedited reunification. Um, we also need, uh, we're also advocating for post-release support as many people have mentioned, what's gonna happen to them when they leave? You know, we're putting all these resources into thinking about volunteers for 72 hours or maybe a month or maybe a couple months of stay. But what are the, where are the resources going for full legal support and also, you know, integration support when they land in whatever community that they land in. And then lastly, I think that uh, some of the organizations around the state are focusing on oversight and ensuring that there is a phase out. These are promised as temporary facilities and how do we make sure that that happens and what kind of community oversight. Um, Attorney General, sorry, that's, yeah, Attorney General Becerra is, been, uh, was in Long Beach this morning and I know that the community groups are advocating for com a community oversight board, not their own self oversight, but community oversight, which up till now has not been on the table at all. So that's one of the that's one of the other strands. So those are like some of the strategies that are being done at other sites. And as far as I know, we are the group in Pomona, all of you here together with us, trying to figure out where how do we want to respond in a in a more proactive way. Thank you for that. The one thing I want to bring up is that with that all, with all that you said is that we can't forget that there are a lot of children that we don't know where they are. They were supposed to be brought back to their families during this Trump era and, and we don't know where they are. And I really worry about things repeating. We, we haven't learned from experience, I think. Um, uh, I do want to say um, one more thing, um, if I can, and that's that that this is a huge bureaucracy that is managing that's involved in this process. Um, I told Hilda and I've told some other people, 
every week I feel like a little ant because I'm one individual. We need um, interfaith council groups, the Claremont group, a larger group in order to make our voices heard on these issues because we're really fighting a huge bureaucracy that has so many, so much to benefit from keeping everything exactly as it has been. And it, it must change, but the only way it can change, I believe, is by people like us reaching out to our elected representatives and working together as a much larger group in order to effect change. Otherwise, it, the kids don't stand a chance. Anybody else? I think this is a great time for us to bring our questions, our concerns, our own um, thinking about um, how should what what else needs to happen from our perspective as people of faith. I just, I just want to jump in and just wonder if we talked a little bit about needing uh, better publicity. Um, a better way to be able to get the word out to what is going on and people are getting snippets um, and how can we do, a, I don't know, an article in the Daily Bulletin, an article in the Courier along with a number of us to be able to reinforce that we want to stand beside this and, and but then get the facts as clear as possible so people are not getting all of this misinformation and, you know, there's a lot of fear, unfortunately, at the uh, unbased fear, but still that's what's always been the approach. I mean, I don't know how many of you are part of a, the neighborhood network next door. Um, <laughs> it's a way to get some insights on what's going on in your very close proximity neighborhoods and to listen to those and yet somehow respond to those and, and yet we need to get that information. So I'm just offering on behalf, I guess, of the Claremont uh, Interfaith Council, but how can we do an article or something to be able to get that out there? That's wonderful. Thank you, um, Thomas. Kathy, and do you Kathy. want to? Yeah. Sorry, what was that? I'm taking notes. Sorry. I just yes. wondered if you wanted to talk about your op ed strategy that you're thinking and kind of. Oh, the sure. The idea. So, building off of Thomas's um, thread of messaging and talking points and shifting the discourse. Um, some colleagues and I uh, are just actually an hour ago submitted an op-ed to the LA Times. Um, and we sort of took three, three approaches. And one was really thinking about the ways in which we are a beloved community and how this challenges that notion and what is our call to action um, to do something about that. Um, the other person who wrote it is someone who grew up in Pomona and her family's been there for over hundred years. They used to work in agriculture and lemons. And then we both work at Pitzer or uh, the Claremont colleges. And so we asked this question of can mass shelters be humane? And what is our role to not just let it happen? Um, so I'm happy to share any notes that we've had. We had multiple multiple drafts so I felt like a student again like trying to rant like trying to do it frantically at night so I'm happy to show, share any notes that we have because there's a lot we didn't use um, and we will probably do multiple pieces so um, it could be something where maybe we have like a database of like talking points or factual things and outlets of best practices of doing op-ed pieces. Um, and we're also exploring doing Instagram posts and having it designed and then taking particular facts or quotes. And one thread would be the root causes of Title 14 that Reverend Lee mentioned. And the other would be sort of the humanity of beloved community um, and shifting it from the charity model to proactively engaging as active bystanders to disrupt systemic harm versus passive bystanders of just letting it be. Thank you, that is a great idea. And, and thank you also for taking the lead on that first press op-ed, I'm sorry, op-ed that's happening in regards to that, Kathy. I think you're right and Thomas is right. There needs to be more places where we can change the narrative, right? Because part of the narrative that I have seen is like, yay, we're doing something about the children. We're, you know, that um, savior-like mentality, but yet we're causing so much harm and people are not talking and seeing it that way. 
So we need to shift it. And then um, I think we also have Gabriela, who is um, the intern, who's willing to take on some of this social media, whatever we decide we write in those messages of what does beloved community really look like for her to be able to, to create them into messages on social media. So that's also another strategy being offered. But I like to also offer the, the so this can stay, right? There, uh, to me, there's also a lot of um, misinformation within, <laughs> within those that call for these shelters, right? And those are elected officials. Our elected officials have really had no experience talking or hearing the stories of those that have been traumatized in the past. And so I would also offer that whenever we create those op-eds or talking points, we also send them to our elected officials, letting them know this is what is my concern and this is what a beloved community would look like, you know, because we wouldn't be separating family members. I think I saw this whole tweet this morning or this message from Norma Torres. And, um, and I thought if, if we really want to welcome them, then we must also tackle what's causing the separation of families, not only here, but across the, uh, across the other countries, right? And, um, and stopping these push factors that is pushing people out of their homes. Do you have any more? I want to just see, open it up. I would like love to hear from other people, um, other thoughts you have about some next steps of engagement or, or remaining questions that we might want, want to pursue. Well, I guess my, my whole thing is uh, thinking about how we uh, educate our uh, congregations and our organizations about this. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of spinning my, you know, going through my head about how we might do this. And, you know, I know within the New Thought community, we have several different radio program, radio stations and things like that, that could be used for education and, uh, you know, activating our committees within the organization overall to uh, address this to our large, you know, to all our member communities. So those are the kinds of things that I think, you know, kind of, uh, well, it's necessary, right? Because we really are in the process of uh, trying to make people aware of this and bring it to their attention where it's not something that just is, okay, this happens and then it goes away. This happens and then it goes away. We want it to be fresh in people's minds all the time so that we can apply some, um, you know, deep intention with building this beloved community. So that was what was sort of spinning in my mind. And, you know, I've been following, uh, you know, there's, I think there's been uh, several articles in the LA Times. And I think that it's good that we've had those articles out there. And, um, you know, I just want to make it visible to our communities. And, um, and I know there are communities that are more socially active than others. And, you know, I think we can build on that if we can share our strategies. There's a question asking me if I can share the, um, some of those op-eds and information. I will be more than happy to share the recording of um, today's meeting along with all of those other current resources that have been published. There's some links at the bottom of these notes. Um, and I think it's just coming out like this whole article and the whole kind of a critique. There wasn't really a critique the first month. This started, these all started in April when they started announcing it. Um, so that I see Carlos has a good suggestion, a media training, public relations training, messaging. I think that would be great. Great idea, talking points and messaging training. Yeah. What I you think that I work with, um, you know, the, the local Latino community mainly, and the message in the Latino media is so wrong. 
Um, they don't even really speak uh, about this issue the way we want them to understand it. And the message should be also um, universal with everyone here, right? So, so I can speak about it and then you, Deborah, can speak about it and we have the same message. Uh, I think that's very important. Can you can you uh, tell us how it's being represented in the Spanish media? Sure, I think you know you, you mentioned Norma Torres and some of the other uh, Hispanic uh, representatives go on media, and sometimes they are not um, they're not telling the truth. You know, uh, they are picturing the perfect shelter at Mona, right? I mean, I haven't been in there, so it might be. I don't think so. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're painting these kids as happy and willing to just stay there. So that is not what we want them, the public to know. Uh -huh. Thank you. And that is not what's happening, right? We've heard from um, people who have, who are psychologists, who have helped the traumas of those in the past. And there's this whole sense of abandonment in these children. And that's the trauma that they will live for the rest of their life. So that is part of what must be said and named and talked about. Um, so I agree, I agree, Carlos. There's a lot of different narratives that I have seen, and um, that must be, I called it, um, we, in the organizing, we call it um, calling out the lie, right? And naming the truth. And, um, and a lot of the times that truth comes up from experiences like Misael, like the parents who have experienced the, that separation at the border. So it's from those that are directly impacted that we must lift up to say this is wrong and then the rest of us have to take and share those stories mm -hmm. in the pews wherever we are able to right wherever we can share the truth of um of such a matter that is up to us then to run with it and i think that's um that's the part that we're invited to at this moment is what are the resources i know i know what i know i cannot do it all but I do know that together we can transform this. And so that's the invitation that I hope that with all of us together, we can begin undoing the lie and telling the truth. I want to float an idea. I, I don't know. I want to get your thoughts on it. Is if it's, and this goes to like Tom's thing about how do we get a little publicity on this? I wonder. And I think it would have to be nuanced. Thank you, David. Um, it have to be nuanced, but like if we did a prayer service, if we did an interfaith prayer service that was, ex it, it was, um, you know, I think it have to be nuanced in our messaging because I know that in the Inland Empire area, there's been this history of this um, exclusion and like, no, we don't want kids here, you know, like, you know, the Murrieta situation. You know, a situation we want welcome, but this is what welcome looks like. We want we want the children to be uh, with their families. We want them to be protected. Or, you know, we'd have to work on that messaging. But I'm wondering if a faith, yeah, slogan like that would be really good. I know in Long Beach they're using protection, not detention. Well, I don't know if we could say family, not detention, something like that. But um, I wonder if we, if, I don't know, there's so many of you faith leaders here from Claremont. I wonder what you thought about that, because then it would give the news something to cover, then they could also start asking their sources questions about what's happening. I'm not a faith leader, but um, listening to what you all are saying, I think I'm hearing two things. Uh, and the first is, you know, if we can have a, a a shared kind of talking points so that everybody here with the slogan, you know, family, not detention, and then the talking points. That's one that we can then systematically, let's say wherever our communities are and beyond. Um, Gabriella mentioned in the chats that she's going to a, a conference this weekend. 
you know, if we could even make a little list of places where each of us is connected and then just begin, we can, you know, in whatever way that makes sense in that context, but to systematically begin to uh, take this list of points and start talking to people. And then the third part would be the media campaign. Um, I think raising awareness is really crucial. Um, and along with that, we have to be pretty specific. I think, you know, what exactly are we, um, we are, are we asking to change? Are we, we're calling on the governor, the mayor, the, you know, the, the city the commissioners to do what? I mean, it's great to say, oh, you know, the children are, it, are shouldn't be separated from their parents and they should do it. But like, there needs to be something specific, you know, as we raise awareness, we say, this is going on. And because this is unjust, we call upon so and so to do thus and such. I mean, I think we need to get more specific than simply slogans and um, raising awareness. Uh, at some point, you know, there needs to be who, who are we trying to put pressure on to do what? Um, and I don't, you know, maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we don't, maybe we're not ready to get that specific. But um, I think at some point we need to identify and you know, we need to cut an issue as they say in community organizing, you know, what is it yeah. we're asking a specific mm -hmm. elected official, city council, wh whatever to do or to change. I, I think um, it's important to put pressure on the, um, uh, on the elected representatives because they're the only ones that can change the policy when it comes to the issue of, of um, no more mass shelters and things like that. And so maybe it's a multi-tiered or a multi-level kind of um, effort that we need to let more people within our congregations and faith communities know the reality of what this is because then they can join in our effort to put pressure on um, you know, Judy Chu and Norma Torres and all the other people who are our actual elected leaders of the legislative districts in which these um, shelters or whatever you want to call them are, um, are located. There is, I think there, there are very few people in Congress who are as concerned and big advocates for immigration reform than Judy Chu. Um, I've met with her several times now, and she has done a lot of work on this issue already, but they, but even she, she's an elective representative and as important as this concern is to her, she needs to have her constituents behind her. And so I think that that's why it's important that we, that we also make sure we target those people. Um, I put in the chat that both Norma, representatives from Norma Torres and Judy Chu's office sit in on these calls, but I don't know what they're trying to do at their level. They never say anything, never. And when we, the question has come up about who's providing oversight over Cherokee Federal, silence, complete and total silence. This, this was one of the issues with the large facilities. The large facilities aren't licensed. There isn't oversight and licensing versus small facilities. So this is a big concern. I think this goes to Gabriela's point. Like I think for ORR and Cherokee, they are the focus for any kind of oversight, you know, problems, issues that come up there. Congress are the ones. I think they're in a sticky situation because they're being asked to do this by a democratic administration. They're being asked to cooperate. This is kind of like the beginning of the Obama term, right? And like nobody wanted to criticize anything. Uh, I think that's what's happening. So I think it's it's important for us to think about, um, you know, that it's important for them to hear from us, definitely. And the and the other part that I think if we want to demand something from Congress is now, first of all, undo that Title Forty Two, and allow them their families to enter with them. Secondly without changing the immigration system as we have, these children are gonna end up detained or deported. You know, and so that's something, as we talk about immigration reform, we must also push for them to recognize the need to legalize 
them as newcomers, but also to undo the whole detention system so that we abolish detention completely and, um, and recognize the humanity in all, in everyone, not just those 11 million that were here before this year, but also these new people that are coming through. So that, that, that'll be important also um, coming forward. And also asking them, right? We're spending, I am amazed about how many millions of dollars is being spent. Imagine if we could just spend that money on the families, on really nurturing, allowing, we can do that. We can allow the families, and instead of giving those profits to Cherokee Federal and giving them to ICE and giving them to all of these different um, bureaucratic entities, we would. Um, what would it look like if we were really investing in these families? Because we have the money, obviously. I know we have about 10 minutes left, and I just wanted to hear where, what, are, what are you individually willing to sign up for? Um, which part of these amazing ideas and suggestions you know, would you be able to willing to commit some time or interest to them? And we would want to, we will we'll, we'll be there, we'll be working with you, but we'd like to know where, where, where we have some interest. Well, I would be willing to uh, help with some sort of media campaign. So I would love to do that. And, um, you know, just thinking about how I want, you know, I would like to approach our own, own organization. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I would like to work on that. And, uh, you know, we have issued certain statements in the past, but I think that we need to have a more comprehensive uh, um, presence, you know, with the issues. So I'm happy to work on that. I agree, and I, um, uh, Karen is a member of the Claremont Interfaith Council, as well as David and a few others that are we still. But I, but to have some type of prayer service or something like that, I think would be powerful. But I think what getting it, you know, when you started right off with a young man sharing his story, I mean, that's what others need to hear. I mean, I, again, just to give you an example, a next door. Or are they receiving room service too, you know? And that's the kind of attitudes that are being, you know, shared in our community. People seeing it as if, you know, what, what else more can we do for them? And we're already, and that's the kind of thing, but to be able to hear someone's story, why they left, what it meant and how, what they went through to get here and, you know, their own future and hope. And, but yet then this whole thing of ice coming in like this again, you know, it's just showing the injustice um, for someone who's really, doing their best. But that's that's what I think it has to be done to be able to counter um, counteract some of the other messages that's going on right now. So I'll be happy to run it by our, our uh, Claremont Interfaith Council and see if, uh, you know, helping to maybe organize some kind of prayer service, press conference, <laughs> some kind of uh, way to be able to change the messaging. I know it's not easy to have someone like, the young man that spoke, but if there could be examples, someone like that, that would be, I think, the really a key way to go. Thank you, Thomas. You know, um, for one, I'm feeling not faith filled right now. I gotta tell you, I'm I'm very angry uh, because my family went through the repatriation. My mother was uh, born in Oregon and ended up in Mexico uh, with uh, with her mom and dad, but at least they didn't separate them, okay? Uh, my dad was in the Bracero program and we know what that did to families over in, in Mexico and in here. And then now to see this, I just, there's a, almost like a rage in me that, uh, please, <laughs> do say some prayers for me because I am not feeling, um, I, I, I wish that we could get that to some other people, especially to our congressmen and representatives, you know, where they would feel un uncomfortable, uh, 
you know, having, uh, having to go through this and not doing anything. I also, um, I, you know, uh, the pro-lifers, where are they now? You know, this is pro-life. This is, what are we doing? Uh, so anyway, with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Socorro. Sasha, you've been very quiet. You've done this. You have a lot of experience. What are, you, what are your thoughts? Um, so what I wanted to mention is that the way grants work in Washington, D.C. is that once the funding is appropriated and a contract is signed, um, short of some serious, I mean, nationally recognized public dissent um, or some serious financial impropriety on the part of the contracted agency, um, very little, if anything, will change until the end of the grant and the new cycle of granting comes up and then it would just be a different technical approach to spend the same earmarked or allocated funding from that appropriation if it's ongoing. So I'm just thinking, you know, from a grants perspective, I worked in Washington for many years and mostly international humanitarian work, but certainly um, on programs similar dealing with immigration issues, both domestically and internationally. Um, and so, you know, has anybody considered requesting, a, like making a FOIA request to ORR to get data about previous years and using that to bolster the op-eds and the media strategy? I mean, there's um, every contracted agency is required to report quarterly and annually, um, and they, they're required under OMB requirements. So any federal funding going to agencies, regardless of which agency, um, is required to, to post reports through a national clearinghouse. So in theory, we would be able to have public access to what's happened, you know, over the past couple years um, with these detention facilities. Um, and if it's not available through that clearinghouse, then a FOIA request, F-O-I-A, the Freedom of Information Act request could also provide more um, information that would be influential with Washington decision makers. Um, and, you know, really, not just um, like prayer vigils and raising community awareness here, but making a very um, sophisticated argument to the appropriations folks in Washington to make sure this doesn't happen or that changes. Because again, once the money is appropriated, it's in the pipeline and it's very, very difficult to shut down grants that are ongoing, like for this 18 month cycle. Um, so, you, you know, knowing who's managing the grant um, at HHS and, and on the ORR side and not just reaching out to our elected officials, but also to the granting agency um, is another possibly more practical um, and effective way to influence if we're talking about specific um, changes, you know, how the um, facilities are run or, or so on. Um, and, you know, certainly getting more funding for the foster family, for the foster system to improve it. I mean, that would be a Washington issue. So just a thought that it's not just community organizing here locally, but also targeting the key decision makers in Washington who do have authority and oversight, um, at least from a, a fiduciary and, and legal perspective on the grant. So just my two cents from a professional perspective. Thank you, Sasha. And, and that's a, that is an excellent idea. Definitely need to look at that too. Thank you. We have one more minute. Any great desire to say or, you know, um, holy rage is also welcome right here. Is there a network being put together? You have all our email contacts or should we put that in the chat or? Please Before put if you yes if you're if you're not receiving emails from Hilda Cruz at Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, I would love to have you on my email list. So please um, leave us your email, um, and I will more than like you will more than likely hear from me again as we move forward. And um, Thomas, I am going to call you in regards to um, I like the idea of a prayer service slash talking points press release to begin saying how we feel as people of faith 
-hmm. right? Yeah. And so that would yeah. be wonderful. So, so when I mentioned about testimonials or yeah. if it's a security yeah. issue, yes. that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Can anybody help us with a prayer service so that we can leave? Give me a prayer right now, a yeah. closing prayer. Um, can I just ask too, where do we want to, when would we want to meet again? Because I think this situation is changing. This was very stimulating, a lot of information. I know a lot of you are going to check back with some of your organizations. When would be a good time to meet again? In a, in a couple of weeks? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Yeah. And as needed. <laughs> Does the same time Thursdays 2 p.m. work for most? Yes. Thursday yes. afternoon, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So then in two weeks, I'll be sending out notes. I'll clean up some of the notes. Um, I'm not even typing it, but thank you for those Deb and then Kathy who've been typing up the notes. Um, I'll, you know, get the recording going. You'll see this and with a date, the next date for us to meet. And hopefully by then we'll have something finalized of a collective resp first response. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Does somebody want to close us with, uh, send us with a nice blessing. We have a lot of clergy in this group. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Victoria, would you be willing to? I have my grandson running back and forth, so <laughs> I've, I've tried to keep this muted. So let's turn with them. And just knowing that God is all there is and God is in this present moment. I am so grateful for this wonderful group that has come together. And I am knowing that we have the solutions. We have the answers because we are divinely inspired in this very moment. Any kind of uh, emotion that has come up is an emotion that is harnessed to make a difference to create this beloved community that we are all committed to. And I'm blessing each and every person as they go about their business today, as they go and talk to their various communities. And I know that we are a holy uprising happening right here and right now. And I allow all this good to wash over all of us knowing that it is done. And so it is. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Will be sending a recording of this? There is a recording, yes. And so we will be sending this. Uh, okay, you'll great. receive a link to the recording. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you, everybody.